Um, I would like to speak to you a little bit about airport finance, and uh, I'm focusing in my presentation about the perspective of the government. So why should governments go to airport finance uh, and seek uh, a partnership with the private sector to do so? Um, so um, we'll start our presentation by just giving you two words about Aegis and what we do, just to put the right perspective. And then uh, I'll focus about uh, the main subject. Um, so Aegis is a 1 billion euro company. Uh, it's based uh, in France. We have around uh, 13,500 employees worldwide. Uh, we have more than uh, uh, 65 years of operations. Uh, so it's an old company. And we are present in more than 100 countries. Uh, the ownership of the group is uh, Semi-public, so we are owned by the French Sovereign Fund, which is Caisse uh, de Depot at 75%, and 25% uh, by the employees themselves. Um, as for our uh, uh, areas of uh, service in the airport, so we cover everything from initial planning and the full operations. So whenever uh, any government has an airport project, we can cover all the, 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 the project uh, from the initial planning of the project, design, project management, and then investing and operations of the airport facility itself. So in terms of portfolio, uh, we operate 17 airports uh, worldwide, and, uh, and it's around 28 million passengers a year. As you can see, our airports are mostly uh, medium-sized uh, airports, and uh, they are between the African continent, Europe, and South America. 400 uh, million euros of revenues and more than 1,500 employees in the airport sector. So let's go to the, once I, I've done all of this, let's go to the main topic, uh, which is why the government uh, find the private sector attractive and why the private sector find this, this business attractive as well. Um, so, um, First of all, because developing an airport is not only, and it was, it was uh, discussed earlier, it's not just developing a city, it's not just developing infrastructure, it's developing a, a full territory. So it gives a lot of um, advantage to a government, it, it gives them a partner to finance, build, operate, <laughs> develop and maintain the assets. Uh, set up a development strategy by increasing the passenger output, so it's efficiency driven. Airports are, uh, will be built in order in, a, in the right way. Uh, airports will be uh, as well sized in the right way and according to uh, sound traffic forecast. Create attractive, attractiveness and diversity, di diversify the resources. So it's, it will be a mix mostly, in most of the, our experiences, the airport concessions are a mix between previous public uh, sector employees, which are now uh, are working in the private company, which is, has been established, and the private company employees. And this, this creates a lot of diversity. So providing a management know-how from a recognized international airport operator, as I said, performance, 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 and this is very important, and we don't really see it uh, everywhere in the public sector. Deploy technical and operational uh, competences, so uh, having a, a private actor that operates airports uh, elsewhere will help in achieving that. Enhance, enhance staff skills um, and the airport management performance and optimize financial performance, which is as well uh, very crucial. Um, so once we said that, being a long-term partner uh, still peaks in activity and difficulties, and this is very important. So we're, it's a partnership for the good and the bad. Which means that when there is a benefit and there is increase in traffic, this is something that will be uh, shared between the public and the private partnership. And when there is decrease in traffic, the same will happen. So it's a long-term partnership and it needs a lot of vision and planning. This is why whenever we're mounting any airport PPP project, it takes some time for us to build a business plan. It takes some, around between four to six months to really study all the case and give the government the best possible solution. This was touch, uh, uh, also uh, discussed a little bit earlier about um, the legal framework. So, obviously, legal framework is very important, and whenever there's a legal framework in place, um, 
private sector investor will feel more at ease into going into any deal with a public sector. And when I speak about legal framework, so this could be covered in one law or in many laws. So the most important points that the private sector would look at are um, so the scope of services and parties' responsibility clearly defined. So if there's a civil aviation authority involved, if there are other stakeholders, ministries, then their roles should be really clearly defined. The approval mechanism and regula regulation supervision controlled by the authorities, and this is key as well for the traffic rights. So whenever we are going into a new airport, um, every, as you, as you know, every country has traffic rights to other countries, and if uh, we don't have a good partnership with the public sector in order to make sure that whenever we're developing a new sector, the, the, the country where the airport is has the right traffic rights with the country of the destination. Uh, if we don't have that, it would be a, it would be an issue. Um, so performance goals, quality, especially quality of service, level of service, waiting times in the airport, everything is, is, is really very well defined. Relationship with different stakeholders, an airport has sometimes 50, 60, 70 different stakeholders. Of course, some of them are more important than others. Uh, concession is at own risk and peril with, with, with parties having economic and financial equilibrium. This is as, as well very important. And termination and cancellation clause, which was discussed a bit earlier in, in the different presentations. Um, so, as you might gather, the most important point is to have uh, an economically and financially viable for all parties. So every, every party should find um, the, 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 a win-win a win situation. Um, where uh, so the PPP is structured, is, is balanced, uh, the, the, the lenders ha, ha, have their capacity to really uh, finance and the right assurances to do, the, to do so, and the different shareholders as well, whether private or public, have returns over the investment. Um, so, this slide really talks about equilibrium because it, it is an equilibrium issue. So we need to make sure that whenever we go into a deal, there's a proper equilibrium between revenues. So the revenues would be aeronautical revenues coming directly from the passenger traffic, uh, non-aeronautical non revenues or other types of revenues like new ones. We, we spoke about airport cities a little bit before as well as, air, as, as real estate. As well, uh, so a discussion that should be done with the governments would be uh, around aeronautical fees because most of the time they are regulated. So we need to make sure that uh, they are at a good level where they're not too high, too low to ensure right attractiv att attractiveness of the airport to other carriers and they won't consider a close by airport because the, 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 the rates are, are cheaper. So once we have defined the revenue, uh, side of, 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 of operations, we look at uh, different expenditures. So first we have the operational expenditure, or, or what you call OPEX. So these are the salaries, the wages, uh, the operational costs, the facility management, whatever we're, we're spending on the airport to make sure it's at the right level of service that we want and the employees are paid correctly. And the CAPEX, of course. So. Some, on some deals there is capex, on others there is no capex, but when, whenever there is capex we need to make sure that um, uh, if an airport capacity increases need, we will do it, but we we'll do it at the right time and at the right size. So once uh, a third level of uh, expenditure is authority remuneration, so whenever we're going into, as, as, as it was said this, uh, before, a marriage, whenever we're going into this marriage, the authority should find also a remuneration, and there's many types of remuneration. It could be just concession fee, so it could be just linked to the passengers or a certain level of revenues of the airport, or uh, it could be a premium that could be paid up front, uh, and then there's the taxes, of course, because as any company in, the, in, the, in, the, in any country, we, the, the airport companies to pay taxes and duties. Once all of this is covered, there is as well a shareholders remuneration, so uh, an SPV, a group that is going to invest in an airport, is, is, is formed by many people. There, there could be contractors, airport operators, airport investors, and these people need to be remunerated as well, so it's, it, it's part of the, of the expenditures. 
So once we put all of this into the image and we make sure that it's rightly balanced and we take into consideration as well the authorities' goals because um, a lot of the governments have ideas of the development of an airport that we sometimes, up, at, at an upfront level, we need to challenge a bit to make the deal more attractive. So th there's a lot of discussion happening even when the idea of a PPP is, is, uh, is there and until the submission of a bid and after that. So discussion is all the time is, and, and it's crucial. And once we have a common goal, we set the common goals, we can go into a real deal. So th th there's two types of, of seeing things. It's either it's, um, uh, our project is CapEx driven, so we know that, for example, a certain country would like to invest uh, uh, 250 million euros in, in or dollars in one project. So, okay, they said, I want you to, to finance that. And then, so once we do, once the CapEx, OPEX, and author authority remuneration are really discussed, we go to the cost estimation. And once we have the cost estimation, we go to the estimation of, of, the, of the necessary revenues to reach equilibrium, and then, we can have a sort of a business plan. It's not really the advice, the, the advice that we give because we always prefer the market-driven approach where you be more realistic. You, we, we look at the market itself, at the potential of the market itself, at the capacity of the market itself, and what could be done in terms of investment. And once we really understand the market, we, we, we propose to the different authorities the right level of investment. And this could be a sound, we, we strongly believe that this is a sound business plan uh, and, it, and ensure the right equilibrium and the long life of a public-private partnership. So, um, I know it was a, a little bit discussed earlier, but here we go a bit into the details of different types of, of, of contracts that, that, that public authorities could go to. And the commitments of the private sector evolves from um, the management contract to a full di divestiture. Um, obviously, a management contract is a light contract. We call it as a light contract. It's, uh, um, uh, to three to ten years, and really it's a, an o and contract where you operate an airport. Um, uh, the remuneration of the private sector is uh, a management fee plus it could be bonus on performances that are set in KPIs. Um, uh, and uh, it's really uh, appropriate when you need to increase the level of service of your airport or a terminal that you just built. Uh, my colleague uh, Paul will, will talk about uh, Terminal 5 in Riyadh uh, later on, and uh, this is something that they worked a lot on in, in, in Riyadh. Um, it could be as well a lease contract, which is a half commitment. The, and the one that we see a lot as well is concession contract, where it's a PPP, BOT model. Um, so it's a, uh, uh, the ownership of the assets remains public. Uh, it's a duration between 15 to 30 or so, although the latest deal that we're seeing is more between uh, 20 to 30, I would say. Little deals are seeing uh, at the 15. Uh, so there's operation liability, so the, public, the private sector takes full liability of operations and, and its risks. Uh, uh, the investment is done uh, by this new company that is hired. Uh, the authorities are uh, remunerated by revenues, concession fees, um, uh, and uh, need of investment looking uh, for airport efficiency, of course. Uh, in, term, in the last one, which is a full divestiture, it's something that we don't see yet in, uh, in our markets here, whether it's uh, Middle East or Africa or other, we see it in Europe, uh, where governments are okay to uh, full uh, divest from the airport itself and uh, transfer the ownership of the assets and the land to the uh, private sector. Uh, so, this graph is helpful to, uh, to show you a little bit about, sorry, it's a bit complicated, I'll try to uh, explain. Um, so, this is a typical uh, PPP, DOT, airport deal on which we normally work. Um, so obviously there's the government um, that uh, issues a, an RFP 
Um, uh, and then, uh, so an SPV company, which is a consortium, which is a consortium of many parties, uh, basically an airport operator, uh, sometimes a contractor, uh, financial investors, uh, that form this consortium, and uh, that have the uh, uh, duty to develop this uh, airport concession for the, for the many years. Um, so normally what happens is that the SPV company uh, uh, of course, has financial institutions to help it finance its, uh, uh, its investment. Um, uh, and then, uh, in most of the case, there's a, 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 a big contract, a contracting EPC contract that has the responsibility to build the, and do the capex. Um, and then there's an independent engineer that makes sure and represents the SPV to make sure that the contractor is doing the job properly. And there's the, the ONM company that will operate the, the airport and that normally is part of the SPV. There are some cases where it's not part of the SPV, that means that the operating company does not take shares in the SPV. However, we strongly think that if the, SP, if the operating company is part of the SPV and takes risks with it, 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 will, it will be much more beneficial to the government. So just to wrap up on, 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 on what, what we just said, um, I think the key uh, word here is a real partnership. So uh, it's in the good times and in bad times, it's very important. And uh, the discussions and uh, uh, communication should be set between the public sector and private sector throughout the process, even from initial idea, the ideas of having a project on board, until, of course, the full uh, life of the, of the concession. Uh, so, um, I would read what they say. A key to success is to develop a trustworthy relationship between private and public sector in order to jointly manage and force face, face all issues with the concession lifetime. Some of the risks will be discussed later on by my colleague Al Corner in the next session. A concession is not a walk in the park. It's something that, it's, it's, it's a process that goes into uh, peaks and it has uh, tough, tough times, so the proper relationship between the public and private sector is essential to make it happen. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Mr. Jack. You can prepare your questions later on after our next uh, speaker. Um, he's the founder of DAA International and now operates in strategic advisory role in partnership where DAA International is participating in investment consortium. He has extensive international experience in both airport and airline business. A ship executive of Data International, he established and set up the operation at T5 in King Khalid International Airport in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And as a chartered professional engineer with an MBA, he previously directed the capital investment program in Irish airports of $1.5 billion. May I call him Mr. Colin Moran.
having uh, initiated um, put a PPP in place. Um, Dublin Airport Authority, DAA. First of all, we're wholly owned by the Irish state. We're what's called a semi-state organization. Uh, we have a fully commercial mandate. So that means we get no money at all from the government. We fund our own Catholics. And for example, uh, this year we're spending nearly 200 million in Catholics, which is a million euro, 200 million euro. So we're spending a million euro a day on, ca on capital expenditure. And we have to fund that uh, completely ourselves. Uh, so 200 million, uh, or a million euro a day is 4 million AD a day. Um, our turnover is in excess of 850 million, and that's broken down roughly 300 million from aeronautical revenues, 300 million from non-aeronautical revenues, and about 250 million from international revenues. So our business is split roughly a third, a third, a third. And airport operations is our core business. It's our DNA. And we've won a lot of prizes. I'd like to focus on a few up there. We're the fastest growing airport in Europe. That's easy said, but hard to achieve. We're based way out there in Ireland, on the edge of the Atlantic. And we're the fastest growing airport in Europe, and I'll talk about that later. We won the European Accessibility Award for people with disabilities. That's another challenging award to win. Um, we're number one for passenger service in 2016. And we're building a second runway. Now the significance of that in Europe is it takes about eight years. It takes eight years to get a runway through permitting and planning in Europe. Not so in the Middle East, but it's a real challenge in the European environment with neighboring communities, with noise restrictions, and all the other permitting and planning issues to get a runway to the construction stage. We've won the ATI accreditation for training. That's the Aviation Training International Award. So we believe awards are the industry's recognition of excellence. And, and, and uh, we're pleased to say that we've, uh, we've got that recognition. And although we have, we have invested and we have owned airports. We owned Birmingham Airport. We own 24% of Dusseldorf Airport. We have invested and have a share in Paphos and Larnick Airports in Cyprus. I would like to emphasize again that our core business is operating airports. And the purpose of DAA International is to leverage that long 75 year history in operations and in commercial performance. That's the purpose of DAA International. By using our expertise, our resource pool, our people, our strategic experts uh, to leverage and to build and to share that experience with the other members of the consortium and ultimately with the grantor, with the government of the PPP. We have a, we have a broad international spread they say about the Irish, they travel well. For example, we're a small country, four million people. There's only four million people in Ireland. There were 45 presidents of America, 22 are Irish. <laughs> Those of you who know Dubai Duty Free, the chief executive and founder of Dubai Duty Free shares the same name as me, Colin McLaughlin. Colin McLaughlin started in ARI. He started in this company. He left us, unfortunately. We couldn't hang on to him. He was too much of a high flyer. So we've been in the Middle East for over 28 years. We're in, we operate Delhi duty-free with GMR. We're in Bali. We're in Auckland, New Zealand. We're in Canada. We're in the Barbados. So we're well used to, we're well used to, to international travel, and we're very well used to, to the Middle East. I thought I'd focus on this because we've been nominated five times, five times for the Root Development Award, and we've won it twice, once in Chicago and once in Shenzhen, 2014 
and 2016. And root development, and I'm going to talk about this later, is at the heart and the soul of airport operations. And we're the fastest growing, I mentioned earlier, we've had seven consecutive years of traffic growth. And by the way, in Dublin, we compete with Manchester Airport, we compete with London Heathrow, London City, we compete with Schiphol Airport, we compete with Frankfurt, we compete with Munich. So we compete with all the big boys. So we're well used to competition. And that's the way you've got to look at an airport. An airport is a business in competition with other airports. Albeit it's a piece of infrastructure, it's really a business in competition with other airports. So what should you, as, as representatives of government, be asking an airport operator to deliver? And first of all, it's about delivery. It's about delivery. It's not about process. It's about output. And you should be demanding in your PPP that an airport delivers three things, three items. The first component that an airport operator should deliver unquestionably is passenger experience. Excellence in passenger experience. Now, what does that mean? That means that you should be scoring above four in your ACI ASQ score. That's the first thing. Or you should be scoring four stars in your sky tracks. Forget the rest. I'm looking at the audience here and I see a gentleman. We're at 4.54 in Riyadh, and there's a gentleman in the audience who keeps beating us. <laughs> we won't come to blows, <laughs> but we're second, we're second in the Middle East at the moment. We've been operating T5 in Riyadh for three years. We were 4.30 last year. So I think the key thing here is that to have a, a it's not a one-off score. It's got to be a sustained trend, a sustained trend of improvement. And that comes from two things, a culture of measurement. You measure everything. I, in the old days operations, you go through an operations meeting, it used to be about kick the contractor, kick the maintenance contractor, kick the cleaning contractor. That's no good. It's about measuring, measuring all your outputs from all your different processes, having a culture of continuous improvement in place and continually improving and maintaining a trend of that continuous improvement. So our goal is to get that gentleman in the audience and get first place uh, sooner, sooner rather than later. That's the first thing that you should be demanding as a grantor of a PPP. The second thing you should be looking for is excellence as a master concessionaire. We, we all know the trend, the trend in aeronautical charges. The trend is south, it's not north. Uh, those of you who follow the famous or the infamous Michael O'Leary of Ryanair, as we all do, will know that he is saying that airports are going to go the same way as supermarkets. An airport is going to have to pay an airline to come, the same way a supermarket pays a vegetable for the supplier to fill the shelves. So we have various, various uh, terms and conditions that we have imposed on all the concessionaires uh, in T5. An upfront minimum annual guarantee, that's the first thing. Get them to pay the MAG up front, not a rental place agreement, not a rental place, not, not, a, not a square meter place agreement. We have a bespoke concessionaire excellence program. So what does that mean? <coughs> Those of you who play golf will know the FedEx Cup, and the FedEx Cup League, and the points. And essentially in the FedEx Cup, the golfers play against themselves. It's a, a, a standalone objective measure of performance. Has our sales increased? Has our penetration increased? What's the sales per head? So that each concessionaire has to report every month how it has improved. All the brands in T5 and Real are number one in the Middle East. Starbucks, number one in the Middle East. Virgin Megastore, number one in the Middle East. Burger King, number one in the Middle East. Because we are constantly on our case, checking their, checking their performance. Um, you've got to work with them as well. A partnership base, of course, is very important. You can't constantly you know, be hitting them on the head. Um, but you can see the year-on-year the -year increase in sales, 
in sales penetration uh, and in uh, revenue contribution. And then the, th the, um, the, the third item, so the first one is excellence in operation, the second is excellence as a master concessionaire, and the third item is current and soft FM, facilities management. Um, you want your a, a, a proactive approach to hard FM. What do I mean by that? That means that about 80% plus of your maintenance should be planned, not reactive. That's how you save money. It should be planned, not reactive, and it should be risk-based. Most equipment suppliers now, it's become so competitive. Lifts, escalators, automated doors, baggage handling systems. They don't make money on the sale, they make money on the spare parts. And they recommend continual, you know, regular replacement of spare parts. You need to take a risk-based approach to that and be more economic about it. Uh, be proactive about your, your maintenance. Um, you want to get your terminal really, really, really clean. That means toilets need to be really clean. Prayer rooms need to be clean and tidy. This was a learning for us. What do you do with shoes in a prayer room? What do you do with salads in a prayer room? All these issues are absolutely key to achieving um, excellence in FM. And uh, we've been voted the cleanest, the cleanest terminal in the Middle East in T5. And we're very, very, very proud of that. I think the other key thing in a PPP or in a management contract is that we as operators should be handing back the asset to the government in a better condition than when we got it. Because when it's built, it's normally built fast, it's handed over. As the term of the concession or the term of the management contract continues, we should be customizing that term based on our experience as an operator, based on our knowledge gained over years. And in Dublin, we were the first ever airport to be awarded the ISO 55001. And that's about a professional approach to asset management. Using your, using your head rather than your hands. So that, that's our goal for T5, is to be the first terminal in the Middle East to achieve ISO 55001. So that's what a PPP, they're the deliverables that you should expect of an operator on the team. Now, I just thought I'd touch on the roles in, 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 in a PPP, in a consortium. Jack referred to these roles and explained them very clearly. But it's important not, not to confuse the roles. There are three main roles, the investor, the financial investor, the constructor, and the operator. And each has to look at his own uh, goals and objectives, but also to work together as a team. And the investor should obviously look for return on his investment, whatever it's He's got to focus, that's his primary principle, goal and objective. And the design builder has to focus on the project return. So I would call the investor investment returns. The design builder has to look at how, how, how his brief, his level of service, his design parameters, and to get that construction done right, and to get it handled over properly. And the operator has to look at the deliverables I mentioned. And each one obviously should have skin in the game. I hear this term all the time, skin in the game, ownership, equity. But it's important that the operator isn't required to put too much equity, too much skin in the game, because then he drifts off to being an investor. So that the operator's objectives should be to achieve the long-term vision for the operation of the airport that the government has when it sets out to initiate the PPP. And what are the measures of that vision? What are the measures of success for a government initiating a PPP? Well, without a question in my mind, uh, the first measure is about root development. I put up a picture of a McDonald's Burger King there. So this is a very advanced, high-tech uh, financial measure. Um, when I studied my MBA, 
we did it on the basis of case studies, as a Harvard-based uh, MBA. And when we did a case study at McDonald's, we looked at what was our most critical business process. What's the most important thing to the success of McDonald's? And you would immediately think it's making really good fries or using really fresh meat in our burgers or... No, the most critical business process to McDonald's was identifying a site. Uh, an urban site would require good pedestrian access. A suburban site would require good drive through access. Um, a remote site would require good highway access. Identifying the right site, getting the permitting and the planning in place, and opening an outlet fast. And in the States, McDonald's had that down to nine weeks. They could identify a site, and nine weeks later, nine weeks, two, two months and a week, they could have that site open and ready for business. That was their most critical process. And I now see after many years, without a doubt, in the airport business, route development is the most important process. Because that's when your business is growing. If you're not developing new routes, your business isn't growing. And what, how do you do route development? It's about identifying Twin City pairs. You identify a Twin City pair, and then you see how you can make that Twin City pair route most profitable for the airline. The first thing an airline does is its route profitability analysis. I worked in the airline business, we did RPAs all the time. That's the first thing. So you've got to make your airport attractive to the airline to come. Now, I mean, it's obvious. It's, it sounds obvious, it sounds simple, but it's not. What did we do in Dublin? We looked at, we had a huge uh, market in America, many, many cities, many, many routes. How could we compete with Manchester? How could we make it more attractive to fly to America through Dublin rather than through London Heathrow, or rather than through Edinburgh, or rather than through Schiphol? in particular, or rather than through Frankfurt in particular. And about, and it took this long, about 12 years ago, we identified we needed a CBP, Customs and Border Protection, so that people could get quickly through Dublin, but more importantly, more importantly, airlines could use domestic terminals in the States. That was the real key. A domestic terminal is about $40 a head cheaper for an airline to use than an international terminal. So that immediately made the route profitability analysis of many airlines so much more attractive to fly out of We now have 65 airlines out of Dublin. We have Air Ethiopia using fifth freedom rights to pick up people from. They fly from Addis Ababa to Dublin and on to the States. And similarly, we're into China, and similarly, we're into Russia. So it's about, making, it's about identifying that USP that makes your airport more attractive than other airports to the airline than they do the RPA. So that's the first thing. That's the first measure of success. Is the airport that you have the PPP operating in growing interest? The second measure of success to me for any government, for any government, is low cost connectivity. I mentioned that I worked in the airline business way back when Aer Lingus, where I worked, Aer Lingus Irish Airlines was a governmental airline. Um, quite inefficient, I have to say. It cost about £500 sterling to fly from Dublin to London. Dublin to London is the second most busy route in the world. So we at Jeddah will be getting there very quickly. But Dublin to London is the second most busy, busy route in the world. The busy route, the busy route in Europe is like a shuttle operation. It now costs 40 to 60 euro, one tenth. It costs one tenth what it cost 25 years ago. So low cost connectivity, and especially in the Middle East, where the, where the distances are so large, where there isn't a rail network, there isn't really a great rail network, low cost connectivity is a second long term measure of success of a concession or a PPP at airport. But I think ultimately, the real measure of success, the real measure of success is knowledge transfer. Is knowledge transfer. If you look at, if I take the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for example, 29 million people, 59%, 59% are less than 30 years of age. They're young, 
dynamic, well-educated people. They want gainful, meaningful employment. They don't want us old guys from Ireland running their airports. They want to run their own airports. The Omanis want to run their own airports. The Qatarians want to run their own airports. The Bahrainis want to run their own airports. So knowledge transfer is the real measure of success. That our job is to work ourselves out of a job. That's our job. We want to work ourselves out of a job. We want the Saudi team in T5 and Omanization, um, Dubaization, Emiratization. It's got to be the local people that we train and educate and share our experience through experiential training, whatever way, that that knowledge is transferred and that they end up running their airports. And these are all examples of people we have. Uh, this top picture here is a group of Omanis in Cork Airport doing training. Uh, this group here is the Irish Management Institute where we take star performers from our Saudi team. We identify the best, we bring them over, and they undergo training and education at the Management Institute. Um, these are very, this is experiential training, you know, sitting by Nelly. So that knowledge transfer is a key uh, long-term measure of success. And these are more uh, images of uh, people doing various training. We have this group on the left here, of the ladies, we have two project teams from Princess Nura University in the airport doing projects for their various masters and, and, and thesis. So, so, so that, that's uh, hands-on training. So that knowledge transfer uh, is, the, is the ultimate uh, measure of success. We're trying to get to 100% of civilization. At the moment, we have about 12 expats, and we have 87 Saudis on our team. And we want to get to 100%. That's actually 99%, you might say, but 100% civilization. So that's, uh, that's really uh, what I have to say about the role of the, the operator in operating the Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Mr. Cohen. Now we are open for an interview, <laughs> question and answer portion for Mr. Jack and Mr. Cohen. Anyone, please? For Mr. Colum, uh, how would you, of just the basic lines of your business model, um, please explain us how you go 100% local and you still make money for your shareholders? Um, and we still make money. Uh, always a challenge to still make money. Um, we, we get paid a, a fee for our team. Uh, and uh, some, uh, Jack mentioned uh, it is at a it's a performance-based incentive fee. So it's a flat fee plus an incentive for, for KPIs. Um, and we get that for a fixed term. A, a part of the, in, in one of our KPIs is standardization. So the more standardization we get, uh, the more incentive we get paid. And I don't want to say more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll just uh, try something about the common project we're working on in uh, Cyprus. So for Aegis, uh, all the operations company uh, employees in Egypt are Cypriot. And we are still the airport operator using Cypriot, uh, Cypriot employees. Next question. Constructor and operator to form a consortium. Yeah. 
where do you position all these uh, three uh, uh, rules of a consortium, a private uh, participation, a public? That's maybe the government. Well, I think the question is that how, how, how do these main three players relate to the public entity, which is the, uh, oh, yeah, which is the main entity? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I mean, I think they would, they would form part of the SPV, the Special Purpose Vehicle. Is that your the question? They would form a part, they would draw up a consortium agreement and form a part of the Special Purpose Vehicle. That would be. Yeah, yeah, so basically, uh, yeah. so basically, there's two models. Either it's a full PPP where the government invests along with the private sector, and this yes. is really a PPP public-private partnership, even in the investment, or a BOT where the government just is the grantor, and uh, okay. the, the full, the full, the consortium is formed by full private companies that will cover the 100% of the capex. There's uh, two models. Two models. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for the DAR group. Yeah, this study coming up with the privatization for an airport. Do you also go into doing comparative analysis to determine whether what is being practiced currently, let's say, the airport is being managed by the government and you are coming in as a private entity. So when you look at the numbers, do you do comparative analysis to determine that let's say currently this is the proceeds or the profits that they are accruing and then when you come in for your possession, what impact you are going to make it so that it would give the government an informed decision that okay it's better for me to go uh, ppp with the private entity yeah we, we, we do we, we absolutely do uh, we work closely with colleagues like jack uh, and other investors you know we're, we're, in, we're in the business so to speak but the, the key things we would look at initially would be um, the business plan, the management capability, the relationship with the regulator, for example, um, the stability of the financing plan, um, and then a whole lot of other operational benchmarks, and a whole lot of other condition benchmarks in terms of the condition of the infrastructure, the condition of the runways, so we would try to get a multifaceted evaluation and analysis. So we, we, we would feel we're confident to do that because, as I, did, as I said, we are investors as well as operators. But our role in DA International is as an operator, but we, we would try to get a good handle on the investment side also. And, and the investor also will have experts in traffic forecasting. And so you have to look at everything. We just can't go in as a as a as a kind of a paid from the neck down operator. We have to look at uh, look at uh, look at, uh, look at uh, all aspects. I I'd just like to add here that uh, many governments also tend to use the services of transaction advisors that will help them uh, initiate the process and de define the roadmap for the PPP and uh, define with the government the right way to do it because there's a lot of uh, uh, places where it's not really suitable to um, I mean to have somebody that will come invest just coming and advising the government. It's much better to have a third party that is biased. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 Hi, I think uh, Rafi from uh, Princeton University. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this informative presentation. See it as a success story. Thank you. But I want to ask you if you could rank the top challenge you faced for operating a T5. Would, would it be? Uh, it goes without saying uh, 
there are some hidden costs, some hidden uh, problems during along the way, especially with the such a practices in the review. So, how, how do you rank the top challenges you faced through this uh, project with the let me ask my colleague, our, our general manager, who is now our new CEO, uh, Nick Cole, to answer the question. What are the top challenges, Nick? Uh, I mean, I think number one is that uh, the asset wasn't completely finished.
is the way it's going all over the world. And I think especially the South American low cost has got to be a huge part of the South American business model. I would just add that low, low cost uh, carriers, I think, put more strains on themselves than on airports. Airports are more beneficial from low cost than uh, they, they are beneficial to their own business. Because uh, anyhow, the, one, the main motivation, as you might guess it from both our presentations, is to get more traffic. There could be complications from low cost coming from two different types of passengers, but at the end we're having more traffic. So it's much more uh, interesting for us as airport operators. Uh, I think the other challenge that low cost brings is, as they push their costs down and down, they are looking more and more to ancillary activities. Yeah. So they're dipping into the through the beverage and the retail that the airports do. So it's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. And I recently saw that uh, uh, with the use of, of GPS, and, and that if when a person is walking through our retail shops now, the low-cost carriers are identifying them. They see where they are in what shop. And they're sending a text because they have them on the ticket to say, we know the shop you're in, we can sell you that item on board and 10% cheaper than you can buy it. <laughs> That's what we're <laughs> So it's a competitive business. But you, you can't not have low cost because it's already started, so you can't push back the tide. So you just have to roll that into it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.